Okay, hello and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Perry and Boring. I'm the founder and president of the Chamber of Digital Commerce. Uh, today's session is titled The Future of Money, Innovative Solutions for Transforming the Global Economy. And today we have representatives from central banks and financial institutions around the world, including the Monetary Authority of Singapore, the Bank of Canada, the Central Bank of Hungary, as well as the World Bank and the IMF. And then we're also joined by a number of leading industry innovators from SDX and Citibank, the Maker Foundation, uh, the Stellar Development Foundation, um, amongst others. I want to thank all of our speakers for being here with us today. Um, in order to really understand the importance of central bank digital currency and the role it is going to play in the international financial and monetary system, um, it's first important to really understand the history of money and how far we've come in just one generation. Um, I'm going to steal a quote or borrow a quote from the former president of the People's Republic of China, Hu Jintao, who said, the current international currency system is a product of the past. And while we're here today with the reinventing um, Britain Woods Committee, I thought we'd just spend like one minute kind of revisiting what was the, re, uh, the Britain Woods system and what's happened since then. So in 1944, which was 76 years ago, after World War II, the Allied nations came together to agree on the global monetary arrangement for the post-war era. And what was agreed to at that meeting is that gold would be priced at $35 an ounce. The United States would serve as the reserve currency, and then all other nations would peg their currency to the U.S. dollar, and they could legally demand gold from the U.S. Treasury. So that's where we were 76 years ago, and then, of course, the gold standard was broken in 1970 or 1971 when President Nixon closed the gold window, and then by 1980s. Um, all industrialized nations had moved to floating currencies, meaning no gold backing um, or fiat currencies. Uh, so if you just think about how much the monetary system has evolved in just one generation, we can certainly expect to see more technology evolutions throughout the monetary system over the next generation over the next 10, 20, 40, 60, 70 years. And that's where central bank digital currency and blockchain technology comes into the conversation, especially today when we have more access to more advanced technologies like the internet itself and blockchain technology, as well as artificial intelligence and 5G and quantum computing. Um, we are living in an impressionable moment of history um, where we are seeing, um, you know, an international conversation around uh, the future of money and how do we improve the international uh, financial and monetary system. Um, so we're pleased to be joined by um, all of our speakers across the next um, two panels. Um, as well as our co-host today, which is the Reinventing Bretton Woods uh, Committee. Um, I'd like to welcome uh, Mark Uzend uh, up next to give um, some brief introductory comments as well. Mark, really appreciate um, your support and uh, your, your, your partnership in today's um, event and uh, look forward to a in-depth discussion about the future of money and the role blockchain technology is going to play into that. Thank you, Perian, and um, thank you, everyone. Welcome to this uh, webinar about, uh, in indeed, reinventing money or how CBDC and private sector can work together for a recipe for innovations. There are clearly signs today that uh, we might be moving faster than we expect to the digitalization of international finance. And in these circumstances, it is very logical that we are hosting today with the Digital Chamber of Commerce these two important sessions that will combine, in fact, both network, you know, the network of policymakers, academic, private sector stakeholders. And indeed, we saw the level of interest in central bank digital currency accelerated in recent months. Recently, the G7 central banks uh, with the BIS published a very important report identifying the principle necessary for any public available CBDC to help central banks to meet their public policy objectives. Uh, the European Central Bank and the Governor Council have also decided to advance work on the possible issues of a digital euro 
and recommend you to, in fact, read their important report that was released last week. Bank of Japan and the government bank, uh, Arico Kuroda, mentioned that they will also make some experiments and will seek to determine requirements and principle for the issuance of a potential digital yen. Uh, another example, the Central Bank of Korea said we run trial on CBDC in 2021, and PBOC, the People Bank of China, uh, under its deputy governor, is calling to accelerate their proposal for a digital one. So clearly, a lot of signs that we are now moving maybe much faster with CBDC, and so this panel, I think, will hopefully help us identify the stage and what it might mean later on for the international monetary system. So this is important for us. I think we might be going to a new phase. And I'm glad that uh, we can have today an important exchange of different stakeholders. I would like to thank uh, on behalf of RBWC, our partner here the Digital Chamber of Commerce, and of course uh, Accenture and John Velisarius, who is a Global Managing Director of Accenture, who has directed all this uh, interesting work John, I will give you the floor to moderate the first panel, and I look forward to meeting you in person. John, thanks so much, thanks, and Mark. all the panelists. Thank you, Perry Ann, for the introduction. Uh, it's great to be here, um, and very excited about sort of uh, uh, talking to you today about CBDC and also the, this exciting panel um, of, uh, and discussion. Before I do that, though, I would like to sort of maybe hand over uh, the presentation to Tim Lane to give a quick a uh, few opening remarks and then I'll go back to maybe doing an introduction and then going through a list of questions that I prepared for the panelists. So Tim, uh, Tim Lane, over to you. Well, thank you very much. So, uh, I mean, the starting point is that we're uh, going through a period of reconsidering what's the relative role of the public and the private sector in providing money. And uh, our existing system, of course, is a mix of public and private already. We've got uh, you know, uh, bank deposits being provided by commercial banks or a whole array of, of bank deposits. We've also got um, uh, we've also got cash, which is created by central banks and central banks also provide reserves or settlement balances, which banks use to settle transactions among them. And that's a mix that we've you know, we've had for quite a long time in some you know, to some degree, but um, this is a mix that's, of course, shifting over time with technology because we're, uh, we're you know, we, we've, we're seeing cash uh, uh, being used less and less in everyday transactions, largely because of the uh, uh, the other attractive payments options that are being offered by the private sector. Um, at the same time, we've also seen some new entrants, um, in, 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 which are would be digital currencies, and that starts with some of the cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin and then uh, has continued with the stable coins which attempt to to uh, establish a stable value of a of, of a digital currency with respect to some benchmark and uh, and and, and uh, you know Facebook's Libra of course is a um, is, is a case in point so um so with that um, there's really uh, a, a question of uh, you know as we're seeing this shift uh, uh, you know what is the appropriate mix of public and private in this whole sphere and um, and uh, you know I guess the starting point is thinking about cash which is uh, uh, something that central banks create and we know that public likes cash for a number of reasons it's uh, uh, it's very simple it provides instant settlement it uh, it's it's very safe. Um, it's resilient in the sense that if the systems go down, or as the example we use in Canada, if there's an ice storm and the power uh, the power goes out, uh, then uh, you know th then it's still available and it's available to everybody. If you, it's not it doesn't rely on having a bank account or having a smartphone or whatever. So so there are a number of features that make cash desirable, both from the point of view of individuals using it, but also as a public good. Uh, in some in some respects, of course, the other the drawback of cash is that it's clunky. Um, you know, in an increasingly digital world, you can't use cash for online transactions. You can't use it as easily at the point of sale when you've got electronic means available. And so, in that context, of course, we're seeing cash uh, used less and less. So, of course, the the question central banks are asking themselves now is, well, is this uh, is this something that uh, we should just allow to to continue, or do, do we actually need to look at cash and see if we can come up with a digital form of cash, which would actually deliver some of the features of cash, a digital version of a banknote um, that would uh, have the attributes of cash that we'd like, but at the same time would um, 
at the same time would would be used uh, in, in would it be in digital form, which would allow it to be used in in, in a variety of other uh, uh, other applications. So that's really what you know we at the Bank of Canada have been looking at for. For, for quite a number of years now, a number of central banks are on a similar route of kind of exploring, uh, well, what would it mean to have a central bank digital currency? And, um, you know, it, it, where we are in that process, I think, is similar place to many other central banks, which is thinking that, well, there's not really a compelling case for a central di di bank digital currency under current circumstances, but that the world is changing very rapidly. And we can certainly see circumstances where a central bank digital currency could be a desirable addition to the array of products available um, for payments. And the, the, I, I guess the, 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 uh, the key thing there is that the world is changing so quickly that um, if we want to have something that's actually viable and could, uh, could be launched uh, in, in a suitable time frame, we need to be moving pretty uh, quickly and deliberately to develop something. And so we've actually been exploring not just the, the sort of theoretical question of, well, would it be a good thing, but actually um, actually exploring the specifics of, well, exa exactly how would it be designed? What would it look like? How would we organize it, uh, the, the provision? Now, of course, um, if we were to issue a central bank digital currency, then there are a number of important risks that would have to be dealt with as well. One of them is, is that um, um, one of them is that, uh, you know, central bank digital currency like cash would be a safe asset. Um, but of course, there is such a thing as a flight to safety, which uh, which we see in, in financial crises. And so you wouldn't want to have a situation where those um, flights to safety become that much more frequent and more uh, and, and, and more rapid. Uh, and, and so there's a question of, well, sort of how, how do you manage that risk? Uh, uh, and, and is it manageable with a central bank digital currency? A second one is 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 really around privacy and the fact that we know that cash is attractive to people partly because it's private. Um, nobody can see what how you're transacting, but we know there's a dark side to that as well. And so, of course, no central bank would want to or would indeed be allowed to issue a digital currency that would then provide a seamless and 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 per infinitely scalable means of money laundering uh, terrorist financing and all those bad things and so um, you have to think about well could you combine could you design a technology that would actually combine a uh, uh, an, a, a suitable degree of privacy with um with a uh, with with uh, with some safeguards against all those illicit uh, and abusive transactions. So so these are quite, these are some examples of the questions that we're we're looking at. But um, but as we go forward, I think a key thing is that is this is not something the central banks can do on their own. Um, uh, and the, and the private sector. I mean, we're looking at technologies. We're looking at something that the public would want to use, um, and that would have uh, that would uh, have state-of-the-art features and with from a technological standpoint. And so it's clear that we need to uh, draw on the innovations that come out of the private sector. And also even in the operation of a system, we would also need to have a mix of public and private sector. And and that's uh, you know that's already the case with banknotes. You know we um, you know banknotes are a direct liability of the central bank, but at the same time they're often manufactured with a, a large degree of of, of uh, of private sector involvement, and also they're distributed through commercial banks. Uh, it's the commercial banks that have the ATMs and so on. So you could imagine something analogous to that, even once the system of central bank digital currency is up and running. Now, that 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 really speaks to the business model around CBDC and sort of how you design that to 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 have the degree of public trust, which is what the central banks would be bringing to the table, with the degree of innovation. Uh, and and a nimbleness that the private sector can can offer. So all of that is um, is is to say, you know, we're 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 uh, we're we're certainly. I mean, it's a very exciting area of work, and it's also one where where we're developing uh, our ideas in in close collaboration with the private sector. We're already talking to a lot of private companies about the various technological platforms they've been developing. You know what are their attributes? Would they sort of deliver the mix of features that we think would be would be uh, uh, desirable from a public policy standpoint? And um, and uh, certainly um, cer certainly that's a dialogue that we expect to intensify at the Bank of Canada. But I think, as I said, other central banks are also on, on a very similar journey. And and the paper that uh, that uh, I think uh, John referred to uh, the, of a coalition of of uh, of seven central banks 
um, that came out a few days ago is uh, uh, is an example of uh, is an example of that too. So uh, so with that, um, uh, welcome this panel, which is I think another stage of public and private uh, dialogue. Thank you very much, Tim. That's excellent, uh, and thank you for the uh, for the introduction. Um, I'll, I'll, what I'd like to do is maybe just spend a couple of minutes talking about sort of quickly introduce uh, a couple of concepts and ideas, and then maybe go jump into the questions for the panelists. Um, the first thing I wanted to mention is, uh, and, and as was already sort of uh, alluded to, was there's been a lot of activity in the last short while on the topic of CBDC. Uh, we can see a, tr a tremendous amount of interest, a lot of publications, um, and, and a lot of movement in the space. Uh, especially with regards to sort of, uh, I guess, the topic becoming more mature and, and focusing more on, on sort of the next wave of, of developments that are going to that are going to be inevitably sort of coming down the road. Uh, one of the areas that I guess, in my experience in having sort of worked in this area for, for a number of years, is that originally much of this started in the wholesale markets. Uh, a lot of it was around security settlement, was around sort of the stuff that was done in, in Jasper, Ubin, you know, and then the various in, in, in initiatives in, in, that, in that front. Um, and, and it's sort of pivoted more into the retail space. So when we talk about CBDC, uh, we sort of see a lot of the original ideas or original sort of uh, exam questions i call them uh were, were really posed in, on the on the wholesale side and and uh, a lot of it is now shifted in the last short while partially because of i guess the that libra as you point out tim uh has has, has uh, created in china and, and so on i think uh, pboc initiatives and so on um and, and it's it's gone into the in, into the much into the retail uh, space as well given also the work that's happening uh in sweden with the rix bank and, and the e corona project and other sort of retail initiatives uh one area that i would like to sort of uh focus in on and and we spend a lot of time talking about this as well because we see an area where there is potentially a lot of uh, value in, in exploring this is in is sort of the cross-border space. Uh, the cross-border, there's a lot of, uh, a, a lot of um, uh, opportunity to explore how a CBDC can play a role in you know, the initiatives like the Jasper Ubin engagement or the project that was, that was done uh, a while ago, uh, explore that uh, as well in detail. But I think there's a lot more in, in terms of the offshore uh, usage of, of, of CBDC held by non-resident um, sort of you know, or, you know, entities and individuals and organizations. So there, there's a, a more more sort of um, uh, interest, I guess, in, in terms of the you know the the usage of this of this in a cross-border dimension. So if I look at sort of roughly the kind of project work uh, initiatives and, and so on. Retail is definitely a big area and has its own considerations to take into account, especially given the plethora of different payment systems that people have access to, payment methods that people have access to today, uh, and whether that's even that's relevant for for many. I and mean, it definitely will be for for much into in the emerging markets and, and so on, in the wholesale space and the security settlement and and other type of wholesale uh, market activities. I think there's a lot of interest, of course. But given the fact that you know that central bank money is, a, is the safest form of money and, and using it for s settling securities is a, is a very very much a, a very attractive uh, proposition but then also how does that play into the into the cross-border dimension when you're not talking about multiple cbdc's being issued by different central banks and what is that what what kind of a new world new financial world does this create for us as well so I think these, two, and I'm not going to sort of spend much more time on this, but I think at the end, it's, it's just bringing all these three things together. The topics um, should be really looked at, I guess, distinctly, I think, uh, in, in those spaces, but also jointly, because at the end of the day, when we talk about issuing a central bank digital currency, it'll cover, ideally, hopefully all these three areas and how that can be and what role that can play going forward. Um, what I'd like to do is maybe start with a list of questions. I have a couple of questions that I, I'd like to ask, and I think the first one, um, I'm going to direct it to Wiki, uh, actually, if you don't mind, Wiki. Uh, it's what problems does uh, CBDC really solve? Is this a solution looking for a problem? Are there specific things that a CBDC would really be suitable for? Um, I, I think that would be, you know, if you can maybe take us take us on the journey, right? Uh, <laughs> what they can help us with. <laughs> Yeah, thanks, John. So um, I, I think from the way we shall look at this is really to look at it more broadly as digital currencies first, and mm -hmm. then as central bank issued digital currencies. So let, let's take a step back and then um, look more broadly at digital currencies. 
of which central bank digital currencies is a subset. And yeah. over here, there are very clear benefits. So one, ability to transact directly with each other. That could make payments, cross-border payments in particular, a lot more efficient. Better models of connectivity. That could enable much better uh, integration between the business processes and the payments itself, which brings about efficiency on a whole new level. And then there's programmability of money that could create new ways of interactions, new and safer ways to transact. So these things which I just mentioned, these are really payment innovations. They relate to better means of using money as a medium of exchange, or essentially how money can be used to transact with each other in this new form. And back then to the specific question of CBDC, Central Bank Issued Digital Currency, I will view this question as more broadly, if we agree that these payments innovations are useful, who would be the appropriate party to issue digital currencies? We have seen already that cryptocurrencies, that stable coins, these have been in the market for a while, but they are failing to gain traction beyond very specific use cases. And I think over here, the issue is really a matter of trust. So would a digital currency that's issued by central banks fare better for general purpose usage? I think that's probably a yes. What about central bank money versus commercial bank money? I think the jury is still out on this part itself. And in fact, I see this is actually a very good reason why there should be stronger private sector engagement. Because if we see that there's value in the payments innovation, we should let the industry work on building these networks, building the payments infrastructure, and innovate on the features that they want to provide. Now, if we subsequently see that there are risks to financial stability, then let's look at issuing CBDCs directly on the network. So there is a view that the monetary element and the payment element um, of CBDCs can actually be unbundled. So the private sector can innovate on the payments aspect while the central bank continue to manage on the monetary aspect. Good. Thank you. Thank you, Wiki. Um, and any comments, I guess, uh, from, from anyone else? Tim, uh, any, any thoughts that you have regarding this? Uh, you know what what is you know what problems does CBDC solve given you know that you're building in a you know digital exchange, and and I know that you've been obviously looking at you know CBDC as as a topic uh, of course in, in that proposition. Can you comment on on uh, what problems you're trying to solve with it? Yeah, well certainly I what I, I agree with Wiki's point that you can you you can look at it as I mean if the public uh, finds a digital currency useful for for some reason, and if that starts to get traction for for a range of applications, then uh, then then it is a question of well, uh, do you want to give uh, that much control of your uh, of your whole uh, system of exchange to one or a handful of private companies, or uh, would it be better to have a public institution that has an explicit mandate for public policy objectives, that has a uh, you know, a, a framework for protecting privacy um, that, uh, you know, and, and it does, has no commercial motivation for uh, for harvesting transactions data uh, uh, to, to target uh, uh, to, to target advertising and that sort of thing. Um, so so uh, so so that there is a case for 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 having it done by by public institutions that that that, in, that that the public trusts to respect their their privacy and to uh, but and also that has a a public policy mandate to make it available to everybody and not just to customers of a particular of a particular platform and so uh, so that so that's um, so and of course uh, uh, I mean there could be a number of benefits to having a digital currency which could in, I think the I didn't really touch on the tr cross border one but that is certainly a uh, that's certainly an enormous issue um, uh, there's yeah. a lot of international work going on now to assess um, uh, where are the obstacles to uh, to cross border payments and to uh, and 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 to, to to lay out a roadmap for addressing those various obstacles but one piece of that is the technological platform and certainly either a um either uh, uh stable coins or um or central bank digital currencies or some mix of the two could be part of the solution certainly not the whole solution because there are a number of issues that have to be addressed including the sort of alignment of regulatory requirements but but uh, but, but but that could be part of the uh, the process of making cross border payments more efficient indeed thank you thanks and 
Tim Grant, any any thoughts on on the CBDC from you know the SDX business that you're you're leading up? Sure, thank you, John, and hi to everybody. I'm, my name is Tim Grant. I'm the, the CEO of Six Digital Exchange in Switzerland, though uh, due to COVID, stuck in New York at the moment. Um, so yeah, look, I think the this is actually a really interesting panel. You've got you've got different perspectives, and the the key is in this CBDC space, there's always a different perspective, right? There's no one story. There's no one solution uh, and there's no one use case or value proposition that, that fits them all. Everybody's kind of got their own perspective. So I can share a little bit of how we think about it. Um, I think maybe actually worth mentioning first is this is a journey, right? So um, I look here and I see I see Wiki down in Singapore and, and uh, you know, been working with Wiki uh, on the Ubin project since way back in 2016. Likewise, Tim Lane representing the Bank of Canada was delighted to be involved in setting up Jasper way back in 2016. You know, this is four years into it. How are we doing? Well, I think I think Mark's uh, introduction tells a story, right? That there isn't really a, a an evolved jurisdiction that isn't really looking at this now one way or another with with real seriousness. So now we can, and and I think John, you mentioned it. You know, CBDC has become a bit of a topic du jour. That and DeFi are like the the, the topic <laughs> of the summer of you know, the, the, the hits of the summer of 2020 are DeFi and CBDC. Um, blockchain is an old story now, you know. Um, so why is that? Why, why are we all talking about it? Well, I will talk about it from a wholesale perspective um, and from a, from a market infrastructure perspective. You know, I'm here representing SDX, but, I, you know, SDX is six digital exchange. That is six group. We are a, uh, a big financial market infrastructure provider with exchanges, uh, and and CSDs in in Switzerland and 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 Spain, so we're we're a highly regulated important piece of systemic infrastructure supporting the finan you know, institutional capital market. So why do we care about central bank digital currency? And it's we're also worthy of note that Six operates the current payment uh, rails for the Swiss national bank. You know we that that's our role in the Swiss infrastructure is to actually operate the payment mechanism right now. So we have a very uh, a, a, a very unusual perspective, actually, relatively speaking. We, are, we we see very closely and operate this infrastructure. So why CBDC? Well, for us, it's the other side of the DVP. It's the digital asset versus payment. You know that we talk a lot about digital assets. We can we can call it crypto. We can call them institutional digital assets. We all know what we mean. Natively issued uh, on blockchains, digital assets that represent something. Um, some interest in something. And in order for there to be a wholesale market in digital assets for institutional players, the big banks, the big asset managers, the big players in the system where the vast majority of, of the flow happens, um, we, we need to have a payment side of the equation. And in order to do that, we really need central banks and a currency. Um, now, you could solve that with 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 commercial money, as it were. You could solve that with coins, and 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 that's been done, and 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 it's being done. But I think we all need that that real kind of central bank fiat focused CBDC to to really unlock the potential uh, of the DVP. Now, that's the next question. Well, what, what is this potential we talk about? Why would that be so important to all of us? Well. We get to it if we if we envisage a future state, uh, and this is again a journey. We're four years in, five years in. It's probably going to be another five years before we really see mass adoption. But in that five year time period, we'll see some important steps, and those important steps will allow us to to inch towards an end game that has much more efficiency, much more. Uh, much fewer potential intermediaries. The roles and responsibilities are going to change in the marketplace. Uh, I think all institutions are thinking about what that means. All of us, the central banks, the the private, the various players in the private sector, the regulators. Like, what does this mean if if the if the if the DVP model starts to look the way we think we envisage it could? Things start to change. But ultimately, why? What's the value? We all see, and I think four or five years into it. Um, it, you know, we don't really need to go into every line item. There's been many, many excellent pieces of work uh, collaboratively and individually that show if you get to this end game of DVP and CBDC unlocks it, the efficiencies 
and the opportunities to generate new business models are really, really exciting. And, and, and that's why I think we're all here, John. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Um, Michael, uh, I guess a view from, from Commerce Bank and I'll, I will ask Puneet afterwards as well from City. but uh, why, what do you think, Michael? Hi there. Hi, John. Hi to the group. Um, well, I think there, there are a couple of things. On the one hand, we do have, you know, a functioning system. So ultimately we can, you know, can have a lot of, whether it's on a wholesale or on the retail side, looking at a pure domestic and excuse because I will always have a very much European look at it. Um, you know, you have the possibility to transact relatively quickly when it comes to instant payment, everything within five seconds. And I would say, I would argue that the majority of, uh, of the requirements that we currently hold, both on the wholesale end and the retail market, is actually accessible with the existing euro system that's run by the ECB and the national central banks. Assuming you, you connect the, let's call it smart contract, in some way of a hybrid format to the systems. Nevertheless, as we are continuously entering into the, uh, what I would call the machine to machine space, and we have done, uh, quite a lot, quite a lot of things. How how we talking now about machines, both on the uh, agriculture stuff, and you now without a segue into the next panel about what we're going to do about the sustainability issues, about more transparency, but also electric vehicles, how they charge and stuff. We should not imagine if uh, car, uh, car companies are spending billions of euros of removing the driver that the banks will put someone on the passenger seat just to execute the payment. So we need to find ways of ultimately uh, ensuring this. And I think for this kind of, let's say, five su fi sub five second payments machine to machine, there is the real need for um, for programmable currency. Now that can be done uh, in the private sector and we've executed that in the various formats collaboratively with some of the people on, on this panel uh, on with e-money. So it works within the legal framework that we already have. But of course, I think from a more political point of view and a central bank point of view, you could argue that um, you know, th there is a need of uh, of allowing everyone to access it. So it's not just, a, uh, as Tim was saying before, just a selected few that are part of a certain corporation or not. Uh, you know, that, and I would even go a step further that you, there is a more, uh, from a European perspective, the potential now entering that uh, putting something, I say, to counter or to balance Libra. I think that was quite a right what the ECB did. But it may even, uh, as the central bank and the governments are very much looking into how do I establish the infrastructure and how what do I rely on with all the, the discussion on resilience and so on. Actually, something like a program of a currency or CBDC could enable uh, a new avalanche of discussion how we want to be, let's say, more of a uh, digital or data sovereignty uh, and relying on that infrastructure and controlling that. So I think it's much more than just the payment that we see, but ultimately the way you want to position uh, yourself as nations and the central bank can be a facilitator in that. Thank you, Michael and Puneet. There we go. Okay, okay. Maybe, maybe we go to the next question. Um, what must we consider in managing this diverse stakeholder community when implementing a CBDC? One of the challenges that we have, of course, is that this isn't just about technology. This isn't just about sort of individual, it isn't about a central bank issuing sort of a currency. It's also about an ecosystem of, of commercial banks, merchants, participants, and so on. But what other things must we consider? When we're trying to issue something like this? And, and I, and I think for that, they just directed towards. Tim Lane, and then and then maybe um, uh, Kawiki afterwards. But uh, Tim, your thoughts on sort of what what about the stakeholder community in, in issuing a, a CBDC? Yeah, well, certainly uh, there are quite a number of different stakeholders that have to be uh, consulted, and you know, partly uh, I think uh, because any new product is going to have an impact on the existing. Uh, uh, institutions in the financial system, then you have to be able to uh, to 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 uh, assess those implications and uh, and make sure that they're manageable from the point of view of the stability of the whole system. So you certainly need to have a a, a pretty good and and frank dialogue with uh, with, uh, with with established uh, you know banks and other financial institutions. Um, I mentioned 
already the need to to have dialogue with technology companies and certainly uh certainly uh you know we're talking to a number of companies that have products that they're that they're developing or uh, and, and also are advising on these things and and so that's um, that's obviously a key element of it but in addition there's sort of a broader societal set of consultation that's needed when you're thinking about a a generally available a digital currency then it's a question of asking the public well what are you looking for um uh, i think i mentioned one of the aspects of central bank digital currency is the for financial inclusion aspect the sense that uh, that if cash uh, disappears from acceptability um there are people who will be excluded from the whole economy and uh, sort of and, and and you have to really talk to representatives of uh, of the disadvantage to people who are likely to uh, to suffer in the event of cash uh, 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 cash be becoming less uh, less readily usable, and uh, and so that uh, there you know there there is a sort of a broader civil society dialogue as well as advocates of privacy uh, issues. Uh, uh, you know various government agencies responsible for some of the the aspects. You know competition, uh, uh, anti money laundering, uh, and, and and so on. So so again, it, it, uh, we're we're actually at the Bank of Canada. We're engaged in quite a an extensive set of dialogue, and of course, uh, the whole other aspect is across border in the sense that uh, if one country int introduces a central bank digital currency, then that immediately creates the potential for other countries to be affected because it, you know, it could come into use in 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 their in, be, beyond their borders, and uh, and and that um, that that can create a whole other set of issues. Thank you, thank you, Tim. Um, I guess uh, also. Uh, what activities, I guess, uh, should we be considering in developing systems from a standardization and interoperability perspective? This is a question, I guess, that uh, there's there's a lot a lot of activity going on uh, regarding the different technologies that you mentioned, uh, uh, Tim. Uh, and and but more broadly, there's obviously a, a role from a standardization point of view and, and interoperability. Um, and and maybe Wiki, if you can touch upon that, that would be helpful for for the attendees in, in, on this call. Yeah, thanks, Sean. So um, I, I think the common thinking about standardization is really that where there are existing standards, we should use them as much as possible. A good example is really, say, ISO 20022 for payment messages. Yeah. Uh, that looks to actually be the norms that most of the implementations are driving towards. Um, but on the other hand, right, standards on the interfacing level, particularly on the protocol level, that's one of the areas that I think we are still in very early yeah. stages. So I'm, I'm, I'm actually quite cautious about standardizations, you know, talking about standardizations at too early a stage. Standardization by definition is really about convergence. Innovation, on the other hand, it's a lot about divergence. It's about testing out different techniques, different mechanisms. And we progress significantly over the last few years in terms of technology breakthroughs, really because there are so many companies and bright talents looking at building new technology. But at the same time, we do want to make sure that we, we move towards a future where, where our systems and platform can actually connect and interop interoperate with each other. Um, we have already seen that network effects are key to driving success of platforms. Interoperability will drive efficiency gains. Users want to be able to connect with a large group of peers. I think in the long run, the economics will drive towards standardizations and interoperability. But there's also a concern that competitive reasons could actually result in a bifurcation of, of the different standards. And I think that's something which all of us should really be very wary of. Thank you. Thank you, Vicky. Um, I have a question, I guess, for, for everyone, uh, and I'll, I'll go around, actually. Um, do you think CBDCs, retail, wholesale, either or both, will be a reality in, 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 in our respective countries and more broadly? In the next two, five, or ten years, uh, I, I, I use that as a sort of a further sort of you know benchmark for timing from a timing point of view. But I, I'd be interested to hear maybe Tim, you know, what, Tim Grant, what your thoughts are on 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 it. Uh, maybe start start with the sort of the the response there, and then I'll I'll go around. But I think is it is this a two, five, ten year thing, or it may be sooner if you, as you're building up these uh, solutions for your business. Well, you got to be careful what you say on those questions. But I tell, so look, I've been four years in the hunt, as many of us around the table have. Um, so it doesn't feel like we've just started 
Uh, I, all I'll do is I'll cite the work that we're doing with the Swiss National Bank. Uh, it, 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 we're on the roadmap to, with an unspecific, a specified time, policy changes. That's what we all want to get to. I think we all are. I think that's true of all of that. That's the goal. Two years, I would like to, th to think that we are we are really going beyond that pilot. You know, we're, we're starting to see some real activity. Uh, I think five years feels really realistic and that we should all be pushing to get to that point. Uh, we don't know what we don't know, but I'll, st I'll, I'll leave it at that. Two years uh, is, is, a, is a, bit, a bit soon. Five years, let's do this. Okay, great. Uh, Tim Lane, what do you think? Hey, well, retail wholesale, I mean, we're basically, uh, I mean, I talked about the retail, about the just sort of generally available part, but of course, as you, you know, as you pointed out, we've also worked on the, we, we've been working on actually in both of those aspects for a while. Um, and, and I think they both have potential. We, we, we've actually used the word CD, CBDC to refer to, to the, 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 uh, the thing that would be available to the general public, whereas uh, we've also, you know, we, we, but we're also at the same time developing uh, digital versions of bank, uh, of central bank money that 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 can be used for transactions. And and uh, at this point, we don't really have a, uh, a, a, a specific time frame. But I think the the, the main point is that this uh, this is all looking a lot more urgent. Um, because of the speed with which technology is evolving, and and particularly, I think with COVID, um, we've seen uh, uh, an acceleration of the shift of activities online, and that suggests that uh, that if if we want to be ready to uh, explore to develop any kind of digital central bank product, we need to move faster than we thought was going to be necessary. Okay, great, thank you, Vicky. Thoughts. I don't think we'll immediately see CBDCs the way we define it, but aspects of digital currency. So we talk about programmability of money, direct peer-to-peer -peer transactions, offline device-to-device -device transactions. I, I think these are innovations on digital currencies that we'll progressively see in the coming years. Okay. Michael? I would agree with what was said so far. We are not talking about any kind of uh, problems on the technology side. It is much more a question about adoption and making sure from a central bank point of view that uh, we are not harming and, and, and not kind of discouraging the trust in the, in the currency, because I think this is one of the, the paramount of old kind of decisions. So um, I would say 18 to 24 months, we're going to see something like that. Just okay, good. Thank you. <laughs> That's good. Thank you. So I hear 1824 five, and then obviously we've been at it for a while and we'll need to do some. So that's good. Thank you very much. Um, Puneet, I think we've lost him. I'm not sure if he's still there, but if you be good to get your perspective, Puneet, if you're still there. No, I think we lost him. Um, okay. Um, I, I think I'm supposed to be handing this session back. Uh, Mark, is this going back to you now or are we? Uh, uh, it will be uh, Patrick who will now shift. Uh, thank you very much, by the way, John. I'm going to give now the floor to Patrick who will kick off and uh, introduce the next session. Patrick, over to you. And thanks to all our panelists. I think it was a uh, great session. And I agree. I think, uh, as you said, it was impossible become indispensable. So I can clearly see CBDC moving quicker. Uh, Patrick, over to you. Thank you. Yeah, th thanks, Mark. And, and John, what a question to end on. Uh, I, I think that's a great segue in, into this next panel. Um, really appreciate all of you taking the time to, to dial in. Um, we had several time zones represented there. So, so Wiki especially, thanks for, uh, uh, for joining us so late in your evening. Um, that's, that's, that's a tough act to follow. Uh, in today's globalized economy, it's, it's important that technological innovations such as CBDCs are harnessed for the advancement of sustainable development rather than contribute, contributing to, to inequality. Um, yet, 1.7 billion individuals are without banks, and 1 billion more do not have IDs. Uh, we're really excited to have this next group of panelists uh, chat about the importance of financial inclusion policies in distributing CBDCs, in addition to how we can utilize this uh, budding technology to effectively transfer funds to underbanked populations. Uh, as we focus on the future of money, how do we want to prioritize transactional freedom? Um, to what degree are apolitical, highly autonomous digital cash-like systems benefiting the most vulnerable? Um, I'm really excited to introduce Harish Natarajan from the World Bank to lead us in this discussion. So Harish, I'll turn it over to you. 
Um, thank you, thank you, Patrick. Um, uh, and the the conclusion of the previous session also conveys the sense of urgency for this topic. So, uh, so I think the panelists are concluding about uh, anywhere between two to five years. So, I think in this panel we will uh, try and uh, um, uh, discuss how some of these new developments uh, and, in some sense, the um, reimagining of the future of money. How can that uh, contribute to financial inclusion? What are the challenges and how it can be addressed? Uh, my name is Harish Natarajan. I lead the work on payment and market infrastructure at the World Bank. And I have with me a very distinguished panel today, uh, Steve Becker, uh, President um, uh, and CEO of Maker Foundation, uh, Daniel Dixon, Executive Director of the Stellar uh, Development Foundation, uh, and Nico Sombati, uh, Chief Digital Officer of the Central Bank of Hungary, uh, and then also Pula Khera, uh, an economist at the, at the IMF. Um, at, at the World Bank and in, in the development institutions at, at, at large, financial inclusion is, of course, a very, very um, uh, key development issue we are all grappling with. Uh, and financial inclusion, um, just to set a context, is not about just access to accounts um, and in also digital payments, but also more beyond that uh, in terms of access to other financial services like savings, credit, uh, insurance, and, uh, and investments. And in a, in a sense, how do you use um, financial services to build your lives, um, uh, secure them, and then contribute to the overall economic development and, uh, and welfare. Um, financial inclusion is low cover. When you look at the statistics behind it, uh, um, Patrick mentions for the headline numbers, but if you really drill down, there's quite a bit of disparity between developed and developing economies. And even within a country, there's a disparity by, by race, gender, by, uh, by region. Uh, so I think it will also be important to keep that um, aspect into mind that while you might make progress on the headline number, but there might still be quite a bit of exclusion. Um, it, 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 from, a, from a broad conceptual perspective, I think um, financial inclusion, there are three key issues to solve. One is how do you bring down the cost to service? How, to, how do you reduce the cost to serve for the, for the providers of financial services? And then from the individuals and businesses who are accessing financial services, how do you reduce the cost of access to, uh, to access financial services? And then how do you increase the utility of, uh, of having access to um, uh, access to and usage of financial services. And there have been various approaches tried towards this. Uh, so uh, there are three themes we will explore today. One is what have been the current approaches to address these problems? How have they fared? And then to look at um, what does the new developments, what opportunities do they offer? Uh, and then the lastly, to maybe look at some of the uh, forward-looking issues which might need to be solved for these opportunities to be, to be harnessed. So let me uh, first uh, request my my uh, colleague from the IMF uh, to share their perspectives on what what do we know about what has worked today, um, and um, uh, and then I will also request my colleague from the Central Bank of Hungary to share their perspectives. So, Pulwa, over to you. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, Pulwa. Yes. Uh, so, uh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you so uh, I, I think you raised uh, very interesting points. And uh, just let me add to that by sharing with you uh, the analysis and findings from our recently published paper at the IMF, which is titled The Promise of Fintech Financial Inclusion in the Post-COVID-19 Era. In this paper, the developments, the role, and or more broadly what you can call digitalization in helping financial inclusion which is what we call digital financial inclusion, both before, during, and after the COVID-19 crisis. So the way we did this paper is that we used to empirical analysis to look at the relevance of digitalization in financial inclusion. And we also interviewed Pula, looks like um, we are having some audio uh, challenges. So maybe while we fix that, uh, Ariko, can you uh, share your perspectives uh, as a central banker uh, in, the, in the quarters of Hungary and then also uh, in the, the broader region? Uh, what we find is some, in some countries, such as in South Africa, uh, Pula, Nigeria, yeah. Mm -hmm. Pula, looks like there's some audio problem. So if you are able to continue now, please do, but you might have to repeat um, some of the things you mentioned earlier, because I think oh. we lost you. 
Okay, sorry, I'll I'll repeat it. So so basically, we uh, uh, did this paper in which we look at the economic importance of digitalization or or fintech in financial inclusion, and I was just talking about our findings. And what we find is that fintech is undeniably leading to an increase in financial inclusion. Uh, and in fact, in some countries, what we find is that fintech has been the only source of improvement in financial inclusion in recent years. And these are countries like South Africa, Nigeria, Zimbabwe, among some others. However, it is important to keep in mind, and as Harish was also pointing out, that this is actually not the case everywhere. So while we see that in Africa and Asia, which maintain an overall lead in digital financial inclusion coming from fintech, there is significant room for further gains in other regions, particularly in the MENA and the CCA, both of which feature large unbanked populations. So one would ask that what, what explains this rising adoption, adoption of uh, digital payment services or digital financial services in general in some countries? And what we find is, then I think Harish touched upon this, is because in comparison to traditional financial services, fintech services are more accessible. So you can access them over your mobile phone. We all do that. It's, it's low cost. They provide flexibility, convenience, are user friendly are more efficient and, and they even allow for customization. Now, in terms of fintechs or digitalization's role, both during and post the COVID crisis, we know that the pandemic has definitely accelerated the shift towards digital financial services. I think this was also talked about in the previous panel because it has enabled contactless and cashless transactions during lockdowns and social distancing. In fact, comparing it to a similar episode from the past, uh, if you look at the SARS epidemic in 2003, it, in, it indeed accelerated China's launching of digital payments and e-commerce. Moreover, we know that governments have also taken supportive measures, uh, such as by lowering fees and increasing limits on digital transactions. And this will likely accelerate uh, the use of fintech services even more going forward. In fact, we already see evidence of this happening. So to give you an example, uh, in Rwanda, uh, transactions in, uh, mobile money transactions increased by 450% between January and April, and the number of users sending money virtually more than doubled from 0.6 million in the week before the lockdown to almost 2 million in the week after the lockdown. So let me just end by saying that these findings suggest that Digital financial inclusion facilitated by fintech, which is one way, could play a very important role in mitigating the economic and social impact of the ongoing COVID crisis and help support a more inclusive recovery. And I would stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Purva. Um, uh, Aniko, over to you. Uh, thank you, Harris. So uh, from the central bank point of view, Good. The financial inclusion is relevant first and foremost because of the currently uh, relatively high usage of cash in, in our economy. So uh, about 16% uh, of the GDP is uh, out uh, right now in the form of cash, uh, which is uh, from the point of public trust, it's uh, uh, very warmly welcome feature from, from the issuer of the cash uh, for the central bank. But on the other hand, it means that about 25% uh, of the population gets their work income in the form of cash. And so the usage, storage, and uh, 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 sa safety features of this high usage of cash uh, results in high economic losses. So that is uh, the primary reason why the central bank promotes financial inclusion. But if we uh, look beyond uh, the payment uh, benefits of financial inclusion, we have to look at also financial literacy. And based on a recent, recent OECD research, which was published uh, this June, uh, we concluded that the average financial knowledge in Hungary is uh, satisfactory, but actually the, the implementation capacity of, uh, of the people 
uh, when they are making their financial decisions is below average. So they are uh, not uh, making financial planning and uh, saving, or at least not uh, conduct it uh, uh, consciously. So uh, this is the other uh, angle that we are uh, following very closely. And on top of that, we also concluded from this research that uh, the above average knowledge uh, in financial decisions is highly correlated with digital skills. So people are getting the information uh, from digital sources. And that is why uh, we embarked in special programs. So we have uh, programs, promote, uh, programs promoting uh, electronic payments and a special program uh, promoting the instant payment, which became available uh, countrywide uh, this March. But we also have a really unique program targeting school age students where we want to reach them and educate them via a mobile application. So that's uh, for the moment. Thank you. Thank you, um, Aniko. I think we will we'll circle back to, to hear about the, um, uh, the, the initiative you have. Uh, let, me, let me turn to, um, uh, to, to Stephen Beckham uh, to, to hear about what um, the, um, the new developments on the horizon uh, what what can they uh, uh, bring bring to the bring to the uh, table with respect to uh, enhancing financial inclusion? Stephen, over to you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, just to repeat, I'm Stephen Becker, the CEO of the Maker Foundation. And um, for me, I start from a very simple point of view, where I look at financial inclusion and say, what is it? It basically is a spectrum of needs that needs to be effectively satisfied by this new technology. And what we can do is have a look at the spectrum and say, well, you know, does this, this, this fiat-backed um, currency, um, does it actually tend to all these needs? And so far the answer is no. Um, when you spread out into the uh, distributed ledger technology and also blockchain space, you start looking at things like crypto, stable coins and CBDCs, and for all intents and purposes, what that is, is taking that, that unit of currency, that $1, that one euro that's in your pocket, and it is basically extending its capability, increasing its reach so that it can actually service the needs of um, you know, folks around the world that never had access to it. Now, from, from the sort of blockchain point of view, it's pretty simple because it takes the inherent characteristics of uh, um, you know, immutability and transparency to create um, an arena, a, a platform where bad actors and nefarious activity um, in all probability you know, gets reduced. And that transfers into efficiency and efficiency means lower costs. And if you think about it from a financial um, institution's point of view, lower costs means you can broaden your client base. Again, if you have a look at the, the effects of execution and settlement you know, happening pretty much at the same time, again, you get these efficiencies from um, the, the distributed ledger and again, blockchain space that translates into cost efficiency that again can incorporate you know, folks around the world that are previously um, underserved and unbanked. I think you know, Patrick mentioned the statistic right in the beginning of the you know, 1.7 billion unbanked around the world. But you know, in the US here, I, I like to bring it down to you know, something more relevant and inform them that the sense of financial inclusion here actually said that there are 68 million Americans in a developed economy that are underserved. In other words, there are 68 million Americans that cannot participate in the US financial um, system. Now, when you have a look at that, you can take a step back and say, well, you know, let's go back to that spectrum of need. Why aren't those needs fulfilled? And it really comes through to a simple case of, well, what is the accessibility? Where is the initiative being driven from? And how is it um, being delivered to, to these folks appropriately? Um, on the one end, um, the previous panel was, was really delightful. I absolutely enjoyed it. They went into CBDCs into, with, with some uh, uh, great depth and, and substance. But effectively, that looks at 
catering for efficiency that hopefully translates appropriately. And that's what we're hoping for. But on the other side, the one thing that blockchain does uh, um, you know, produce is this characteristic of permissionless, permissionlessness or trustlessness, where autonomy, the ability for you to take over and to control your own sort of financial destiny becomes relevant. So not only does blockchain increase the, the spectrum of, of capability and accessibility, it also increases the spectrum of autonomy versus um, you know, outsourced um, capability. And to have that in place brings everyone up. It allows more folks around the world who've never had access to actually have access. Now, given the fact that the infrastructure is there, the distribution channels there, one of the risks that we need to think about is you know, rethinking what the internet infrastructure needs to be to be able to support all this. But essentially, the, the idea here is decentralization and autonomy has increased that spectrum of capability. And new entrants, new competitors, new ideas uh, become available, new uh, um, aspects of generating value and transferring value and thinking about payment systems in a new way. Um, really promotes this ability to bring these underserved and unbanked folks on board. Uh, but ultimately, it's not to the exclusion of the traditional economy. It is basically an extension of a dovetail, if you will, of value with the traditional economy. And that's where I believe that we can space of um, you know, stable coins, crypto and, and CBDC really enhance its capability of um, bringing folks into the, the financial system. Thank you. Um, uh, Daniel, uh, let me uh, pass it to you to uh, hear your perspective and uh, uh, to, uh, to all the participants, please do feel free to put your questions on the chat window. I will try and integrate those questions in the, in the next, um, uh, next round. So Daniel, over to you. Thank you, Harish. Um, again, my name is Danelle Dixon. I'm the CEO and Executive Director of the Stellar Development Foundation. I love everything that's been said because I think it's all um, paints that picture of how we can use technology and uh, this new technology to actually create this uh, the financial inclusion that I think a lot of us feel like needs to happen all over the world. Uh, I think one of the most important things is what Stephen ended on, and that's the idea of the fact that this is enhancing the existing financial structure and the infrastructure that's there. It's not trying to supplant it. And that's so important because if you're trying to actually get everybody onto the same exact rails everywhere in the world and have them reinvent what they already have, it's not going to happen. But if you can integrate very seamlessly with the existing financial infrastructure and all these different geographies, it creates an opportunity for us to come together and to be able to build upon and to give value to not just the developers who can develop on those platforms, but also the individuals who can benefit from that development. So I think that you know what we're doing at Stellar is focusing on this notion of building this decentralized permissionless platform that we can have lots of creativity from uh, developers out there build upon getting and, and, and enhancing that infrastructure that exists right now. Uh, the second thing I think is really important is that in order to make this work, you need to make that development simple and easy for developers and also to make it cost effective for them. One of the worst things that you can do is create a platform that is very expensive to utilize for developers because then those costs are transferred down to the individual consumers. Uh, and I think that's what blockchain can do. And I think it is already doing it today. We see just on Stellar, the opening up of corridors between Nigeria and, and uh, Europe and Nigeria and the US and also um, in Latin America and Nigeria and lots of different corridors open. And when you see those corridors open, you see development um, of this creativity by these innovators in those regions that actually understand what the consumers there need and they can build that. Not just consumers, but also what the businesses need uh, in order to be able to get their money from one geography to another. And so if you think about development and, and, how, um, and, and, and how blockchain actually works, it's actually very cheap for the developers to build on top of it, especially if it's an open permissionless network so that you don't have to actually pay license fees or any of those things to make it work. So I think that's the second thing that's really important. And then the third area, which I think we sometimes forget when we're dealing with new technology, is in order to really make this happen, we need to make it so simple for the consumer or for whoever your identified audience is. And I think that sometimes with new technology, we focus so much on the newness and 
wonderful ideas that the technology offers and forget that the user experience is the most important thing. And I think we're finally getting to that with blockchain where we're actually focused on solving those user problems with UX designs in simple and straightforward and feel safe to them, which I think is a really important way to think through when, in, when someone doesn't have access to the banking infrastructure and all they really want is to be able to put their money into a digital asset and maybe just hold it there so that they don't actually suffer the inflation in the existing um, in their in their geography or they want to be able to transfer that very quickly to uh, a family member or to a business that they want to support in another region they can do that but you have to make it simple and so ux design is crucial to be able to think this through and just like in the early days of the web it took us a bit to get to that really simple ux design i think it took us some time to get there for blockchain but we're there now we have very simple wallets. We have simple ways to recover your passwords. One of the things that Steven said is that the idea that you can have this autonomous and own your experience and that you don't have to rely on a custodian to do it for you. But it's important that we think about that from the standpoint of, yeah, you want that, but you also want that to be simple. Because if you have to remember a 54 uh, digit phrase or password to be able to access it or your uh, to be able to get into your account, it makes it complicated. So I feel like we're moving in the right directions to be able to get to this idea of true financial inclusion by thinking about the end user, whoever that end user might be. Thank you, Daryl. Um, so Stephen and, and you um, both um, kind of uh, highlighted the, the um, that um, these, these new developments, in, in a sense, have to be seen as as building on the existing financial infrastructure, the integrating with the existing infrastructure. And then I think that, that's a point very well made. Um, but but in, in some of the country context, which Puva was referring to, and then also the more generally the, the developing world, the um, the existing infrastructure has has gaps and, and weaknesses, right? Uh, and which are being addressed through traditional um, approaches. Um, so in that kind of a context, one of the biggest issues is related to IT, right? Um, so are there any kind of um, fundamental uh, requirements or enablers for these new solutions to work? Uh, they do, does the lack of that, uh, is that a constraint? Um, and uh, what, in, in general, what are the other challenges um, you, you expect um, uh, to, to encounter? So maybe I would request um, all the panelists to, to, to come in and which will order you feel comfortable. And maybe as part of that, Daniel, you could, if you could also elaborate on your specific experience with respect to the Nigeria, Europe, um, the corridors where you were mentioning, um, so that will also be helpful. So, um, so maybe um, who wants to go first? Uh, Stephen, do you want to go first? Yeah, sure, by all means. <clears throat> I'll actually keep this quite um, short and sweet. The, the idea here is to start looking at the internet infrastructure. I mean, we're talking about 50-year-old um, infrastructure that maybe needs to be you know, rehashed. Considering that mobile is, is a great step forward, still we need to to consider what that sort of reframe will look like going forward even if you know you 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 know discount blockchain you have a look at just dlt with respect to cbdc's it's going to be extraordinarily important to make sure that it operates appropriately but the the gaps that you talk about and you know i am originally from south africa so i, I do understand the sub-saharan um economics and i know that there is um, a large technological gap between, you know, what is required and what is needed. And consequently, I find that when you take the current financial infrastructure and you create a cost initiative and an incentive, you generally find that spillover into those environments, into those gaps that actually make um, a solution and a solution that works. Um, it never happens in a linear fashion. It always is, in, is a, you know, strangely chaotic, but it ends up working quite well. But ultimately, the, the driving efficiency is cost and then the recognition of um, basically illiquid capital or what um, um, I think Hernando de Soto called dead capital, the recognition of being able to switch that on and creating value out of it actually comes as a further incentive to, to you know, bridge those gaps and essentially bring um, the folks that were previously underserved and banked into an environment where they can be self-sufficient, not only from a financial point of view, but from a productive, from a productivity point of view as well. Um, so ideally, it starts off with 
basic infrastructure such as internet, but ultimately ends up with cost efficiencies which drive incentive. Yeah, I, I agree with that 100%. Um, go ahead. Oh, if, if you, ahead. From, from, if you think about the, the idea that, um, and I'll, I'll use the Nigeria example, what we need is um, to be able to fill in some of the, the gaps would be these financial institutions uh, all over the world who are uh, interested and want to issue a digital asset based on their local currency. Uh, we have that in Nigeria. We have that with um, an institution called Cowry. They've issued an NGNT asset. Um, we also have that in Europe, for example, and this is how this corridor became really strong, where they there's an entity called Tempo. They've issued a, a euro asset. And so Calgary has customers that want to be able to, business customers that want uh, payments from Nigeria to Europe. And so they've been, and then the, and then buy and get that back. And the, the customers don't necessarily want to or care about how it gets there, meaning that they don't think about like the technology, the underlying stack that they're utilizing. What they want to see is that the money is leaving their bank account and ending up in the bank account of the uh, their vendor or their business partner in Europe. That's how it happens seamlessly, but they're using blockchain to get it there. Calgary is and Tempo are, but the end users don't actually need to understand the details of how that's working through. They can, but they don't have to. And so that's how you make these corridors work is by issuing these digital assets uh, and opening up the, the opportunity for these institutions to be able to transact seamlessly. Um, so I see, we see more and more of this happening in, in different geographies. In Africa, we see a lot of interest and we've had, a, we actually, uh, we, we will later in the week, we do our Q3 analysis for, um, for Stellar, the network. And we talk about how that it's improved in terms of all these different banking infrastructures that have set up. So for us, that that's the, the biggest and most important um, piece to put in play in all these regions. And then I have to just say, and I know I already talked about this, but and then it's the ability to use mobile devices to be able to execute these transactions for the individuals if we really want to get to financial inclusion, because not all of them have the computers that we have access to, but they actually a lot of them have the mobile devices and so they can actually have all of these things transact very seamlessly on those devices. So I think with those two things, you can actually bring together a lot of opportunity to be able to solve this problem. Now, uh, let me Thank add you. to that. I think, um, so I think everyone, we've talked about how technology has a lot of potential. And I, I think what the Harish, you were touching upon uh, and the other panelists was that, even though it has a lot of potential, we can't take it for granted as uh, as it is perhaps leading to new forms of financial exclusion, which could actually worsen with the COVID shock. So as you know, the others were mentioning individuals who do not have access to digital infrastructure. So that means to electricity, to mobile, to internet coverage, even digital ID, even people who lack financial and digital literacy could, could be excluded. Uh, moreover, inherent biases and date in data and algorithms could also result uh, in the vulnerable population being uh, left behind and hence could actually exacerbate existing inequalities. Therefore, it's important to keep in mind that governments currently have a very critical role to play to address all these constraints and to avoid this risk of financial exclusion going forward. One more thing that I would say is that this crisis is also the first test of resilience of fintech companies. So it is mainly uh, the first major downturn in the business cycle that these tech companies are facing. Uh, and what we found in our work, uh, in our paper, is that some fintech firms, especially the smaller ones and those with thinner buffers, are being very hit hard by tightening of funding. They've been facing rising non-performing loan ratios and a drop in transaction and credit demand. So uh, just to quote some numbers, Asia saw a 69% drop in funding and a 23% drop in deals quarter over quarter in the, in the fintech funding sector. So what could happen is that widespread consolidation and retrenchment could happen amongst these start startups and these new tech companies that could eventually lead to greater concentration in the fintech sector and actually could set back the progress that has been made in financial inclusion over the recent years. In fact, uh, preliminary data is already showing that many of these fintech companies have completely stopped any new lending since the start of the lockdowns. 
Hence, it is important to ensure that the fintech landscape and the financial system in general remains sufficiently competitive post uh, the pandemic. And I think the last thing that I would add is that investing in human capital is also equally important in order to ensure that innovation can continue to take place as many low income and developing countries uh, face a shortage of workers with these tech skills. And that is both in the banking and in the non-banking sector. So I think that is also an important aspect that should be a uh, prioritized going forward. Thank you. Um, one of the um, aspects which Daniel was emphasizing was on usability, the user experience, and um, uh, Aniko was earlier referring to also the financial literacy and, and digital literacy aspects. So Aniko, um, you uh, left us with um, a tantalizing thought about uh, some uh, initiatives on your side. So why don't you um, uh, go ahead and talk about that um, at, at this point uh, and how, how you think that will help address the uh, financial literacy and, um, and improve the user experience. Uh, thank you, Harry. And uh, just uh, uh, I would like to refer back to what uh, Purva said that uh, uh, based on also these vulnerabilities uh, that uh, the payment service providers uh, can suffer from, uh, a natural way can lead to central bank digital currencies, where the central bank or central authority runs. Uh, uh, payment account for, for all the citizens. And actually, uh, this is what we have already accomplished in a small scale uh, for uh, students participating in our pilot project because the Central Bank of Hungary just issued a mobile application where um, we actually run a virtual account for a participating student and they are not storing money, but they are storing earned, uh, earned digital coins that they can earn by filling up uh, 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 quizzes uh, in the field of financial literacy, in the, in the field of sustainability and, uh, and digital world knowledge. So we not only uh, run the account, but we also want to increase the financial knowledge with gamification uh, uh, means. And at the end of the program, which is linked to a school year, they can also spend these earned virtual assets on real uh, presents provided by the central bank. So in a small scale, they are uh, ga getting uh, money on the uh, account and they are spending it uh, from the central bank account and uh, this uh, not only promotes uh, financial literacy and uh, the conscious uh, thinking of how to save money and how to uh, spend money but it also serves as a pilot for for the central bank itself and how to make such platforms that can be uh, the seed for a wider scale CBDC in the future. Thank you. Um, uh, uh, thank you, uh, Aniko. Um, maybe just um, one quick question to both Steven and then Daniel. Um, is there any particular regulatory or policy challenges you see for these solutions to, uh, to really become uh, integral uh, in addressing the fashion inclusion challenges. Janelle, you want to go first this time? Sure. I'll, I'll say that I think that uh, the regulation, we've already seen that um, a, a lot of regulatory bodies and governments think of the underlying technology as very similar to the internet. And so we believe very strongly that that shouldn't be regulated, that is decentralized and um, it's a makeup of lots of different um, computers all over the world, very much in the same way that the internet is. Uh, I think that the regulatory challenges um, that we have uh, is getting regulators and governments comfortable with the idea that the digital currency is safe and that we uh, that there are they already know how to regulate um, money. They've been doing it for years and years and years and are exceptionally good at it. 
And so to get them to understand that the that all these financial institutions that are operating on the platforms are already regulated and are already seated in and have to comply with the local regulations that exist. So making sure that, you know, and maybe there's gaps in certain in certain countries and those gaps might need to be filled by some regulation. But the notion that I think is really important is that there should be this trust and this comfort in the existing regulations that it's covering these entities because they're touching fiat. They're touching fiat to convert it into digital assets. And so once they do that, you already know that they have a regulated financial institution in those regions. Um, so I feel very strongly that as long as we continue to engage with regulatory bodies, that's something that we do at Stellar, that's something that other entities um, spend a lot of time doing. I think it's really important. Um, it's what we did wrong when we were uh, to figure out privacy on the web. We didn't do a lot of engagement and we said, hey, we're the tech industry, we can handle this. And that was wrong. Um, and I think now we're actually engaging and, and talking and having conversations um, and showing. And because a lot of this has to be that you can't just say trust, you have to say trust, but verify. Uh, that's what we do with decentralized code. That's what we do with open source code. Uh, so I feel like the regulatory um, angle out there is just to continue these conversations and to really be comfortable that these financial institutions that are that are already touching the fiat um, on these networks are already regulated entities. So I'm excited uh, to be able to have these conversations and we do them quite quite regularly. And I, I feel like we're moving in the right direction with respect for it. Thank you. Stephen, uh, you, you have a minute. That's fine. I'm, I'm gonna use a, a, an analogy that seems to always, just extending off what Danelle was saying. When I think of decentralization, I always think of, um, you know, if blockchain, if, sorry, if Bitcoin was stable, you know, what would the regulators think about it? And I've engaged with quite a few of the regulators have been doing so for the last two years. And the analogy I always use is, well, think of decentralization like the ocean. If you want to regulate the ocean, that's going to be really hard. You're not going to be able to do it. But you can regulate the ports, the harbors, the shipping lanes, the ships, and basically every other craft that goes on it. And if you keep that in mind, then it's very easy to see how apparatus can actually be used appropriately and you do have the tooling, you do have the facilities. And as Danal said, there may be gaps, but those gaps are easy to fill if you just start from the point of you actually have the, the tools in place. Thank you. Um, uh, I, I get the analogy, Stephen, but then there's something called the law of the ocean. Huh? Uh, so, so, but I do understand the, the analogy. Uh, so I think um, uh, given, given, the, um, given the time constraint, I think we'll have to wrap up now, but just to, just to highlight, I think, uh, the couple of so some of the key points made uh, are really about helping and engaging with the regulators to help understand the, the technology, help understand uh, what it really means. And I think uh, perhaps we can also draw inspiration from what Aniko was mentioning about the experiential aspect of learning. Uh, I think that also um, would help. And there are a number of things which can be done. And I think the idea is to see how we can do it all together and, and leverage the um, uh, the advantages of uh, what. what these new developments can bring together. So with that, uh, let me thank all the panelists uh, for a good discussion. Um, and then hopefully uh, we identified a few things which can be built on in a future discussion. So with this, let me pass it back to, to Patrick. Harish, th thank you. I, I'm impressed by your, so your time management here in addition to, uh, to your moderator abilities. Uh, we're really pleased to have had all these uh, esteemed panels showing us today. So Harish, Steven, Danelle, and Eko Purva, thank you very much for taking time to, to join this discussion and provide your valuable insights. Um, to those that dialed in, thanks for spending 90 minutes with us. We know that's a big ask. Um, we, we thought that, that this content was worth putting forward uh, and, and having you consume. Um, we will make this available on demand afterwards. You can find it on our YouTube channel. Uh, and if you have any questions or want to get engaged in the work we're doing here at the chamber, feel free to reach out to me. Uh, I'm, I'm Patrick at digitalchamber.org. Um, and again, we're very grateful for everyone's time and, and the um, participation and partnership that uh, Mark Uzan and the Reinventing Brett Woods uh, Committee has, has brought to the table here. So we look forward to putting on similar events like this in the future. Um, thank you. And I hope everyone has a great rest of, of your day, afternoon, or evening.